Hello everyone, this is News Distillate, your go-to source for daily news, where we provide you with the news you need in a concise and timely manner. And now, let's get started with our first news with my co-host, Emma. Thank you, Hussein. Good evening, everyone. My name is Emma, and I'm here to tell you about a fascinating new study about butterflies. Did you know that butterflies are actually related to moths? Well, a new study suggests that these beautiful creatures originated in North America after splitting from moths. This discovery was made by Akito Kawahara, who has been passionate about butterflies since he was a child. He remembers being eight years old when he visited the American Museum of Natural History in New York City and saw a family tree of butterflies with a lot of blank spots. He was determined to fill in those blanks and find out where these insects originated. To piece together the butterfly family tree, Kawahara and his team collected DNA from all kinds of butterflies. They traveled to the Amazon rainforest, the dry savannas of Mozambique, and even nabbed a yellow sulfur butterfly right outside Kawahara's office in Gainesville, Florida. Using four supercomputers to run the genetic analysis, they were able to determine that butterflies probably first flapped their wings in present-day Western North America or Central America. They also discovered that butterflies spread across the world in waves from South America to Asia, Australia, India, Africa, and finally Europe. This research is important for conserving butterflies, the flowers and plants that rely on butterfly pollination, and the species of birds that depend on butterflies for food. Kawahara's butterfly collection is a special reminder of his father, who inspired him to turn his passion for these insects into a profession. So Hussein, what news do you have for us? Oh, today we have some interesting news. Congress is trying to regulate artificial intelligence, AI, but they have a lot of catching up to do. AI is a type of technology that can learn and make decisions on its own. It's been used in many different ways, from helping with medical diagnoses to powering self-driving cars. Congress is trying to make sure that AI is used for good and not for harm. They want to make sure that AI is used responsibly and ethically, but it's not easy. AI is changing so quickly that it's hard for Congress to keep up. To help them understand AI better, a bipartisan group of House members will host a top industry figure for a joint dinner on Monday night. On Tuesday, a Senate panel will hold a hearing to consider new oversight of the technology. But Congress has a history of not regulating new technologies very well. It's like trying to put brakes on a runaway train. There aren't enough experts in both computer science and law on Capitol Hill, which makes it even harder. Senator Josh Hawley, a Republican from Missouri, is interested in the Democratic leader's plans. He's the top Republican on a Senate Judiciary Committee subpanel that will examine AI oversight options in a hearing on Tuesday. He's concerned about the power of AI to influence elections. Senator Gary Peters, a Democrat from Michigan, is also looking into AI. He's written four bills related to AI and plans to hold at least one hearing on AI during every work period. Rep Ted Liu, a Democrat from California, will co-lead a bipartisan dinner hosting OpenAI CEO Altman on Monday. The majority leader, Senator Chuck Schumer, is determined to make sure AI is used for good. He's trying to build a bipartisan consensus behind his legislative framework. He believes that how we deal with AI will determine the quality of life for this generation and future generations. That's all for today. Back to you, Emma. Thank you, Hussein. Today, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, proposed a rule that would require coal and gas-fired power plants to nearly eliminate their carbon dioxide emissions in just over a decade. This means that the plants would no longer be allowed to spew climate warming carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. This is a huge step forward in the fight against climate change. The rule is based on technologies that capture and store carbon dioxide deep underground. This means that the power plants would have to install new equipment to capture the carbon dioxide and then store it underground. Some facilities that plan to shut down in the near future or that operate at less than 20% of their capacity would be subject to less stringent requirements. Environmental groups are welcoming the rules, which are almost certain to face opposition and a legal challenge from the fossil fuel industry and its allies. The EPA projects that the rules would avoid up to 617 million metric tons of carbon dioxide through 2042, which is the equivalent to the annual emissions of 137 million passenger vehicles. The regulations would also bring health benefits by reducing other air pollutants, such as particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxide. The EPA projects that in 2030, the proposed rules would prevent 1,300 premature deaths, more than 800 hospital and emergency room visits, and more than 300,000 cases of asthma attacks. 
President Biden came into the office with the most ambitious plan to address climate change of any major party candidate in U.S. history. And this proposed rule is a big step in the right direction. The proposed rules set emission limits for power plants and then let power plant owners decide how they'll meet the requirements. This is a great example of how we can take action to reduce climate pollution and its associated costs. We need to continue to work together to ensure a better future for our planet. Back to you, Hussein. Thank you, Emma. New York State is taking a bold step to reduce air pollutants and prevent premature deaths by banning fossil fuels in new construction starting in 2026. This means that any new buildings seven stories and under will not be allowed to use fossil fuel equipment such as gas stoves. However, large commercial or industrial buildings 100,000 square feet or more are exempt from this ban. By 2029, the ban will apply to all new construction. Our sources are saying that this move will help reduce carbon emissions and make energy more affordable for underserved populations. However, the American Gas Association president and CEO Karen Harbert has expressed her concern that this ban will raise costs to consumers and jeopardize environmental progress. It's clear that New York is taking a big step to reduce emissions and make energy more affordable for its citizens. But it's also important to consider the potential impacts of this ban on consumers and the environment. We can only hope that this move will be beneficial to all. That's a bold move by New York, Hussein. Do you think it will be beneficial to all? Absolutely. It will reduce emissions and make energy more affordable for underserved populations. But we must also consider the potential impacts of this ban on consumers and the environment. OK, then. What's our next news, Emma? Thank you, Hussein. It looks like Mike Pence might be running for president and his supporters are getting ready by launching a super PAC. A super PAC is a political action committee that can raise unlimited amounts of money to support a candidate. Former Vice President Pence has been making trips to early voting states like Iowa and New Hampshire, and now his supporters are taking it a step further. A group of longtime Republican operatives have launched the Committed to America PAC to support Pence's expected presidential campaign. The PC is co-chaired by former Reverend Jeb Hensarling from Texas and Scott Reed, who managed the 1996 presidential campaign for former Kansas Senator Bob Dole. Bobby Sapporo, the executive director of the PAC, ran Georgia Governor Brian Kemp's successful campaign in 2022. Kemp is known for defeating Trump's hand-picked candidate in that race by more than 50 points. The PAC is trying to separate Pence from Trump and make him look like a traditional conservative who could be a more predictable and palatable alternative. They are emphasizing Pence's unparalleled commitment to conservative principles and the Constitution and his uncommon character. Pence is scheduled to return to both Iowa and New Hampshire in the next three weeks, so it looks like he is serious about running for president. It will be interesting to see how this plays out and if Pence can gain enough support to challenge Trump for the GOP nomination. So, Emma, it looks like Mike Pence is gearing up for a presidential run. What do you think of his supporters launching a super PAC? Absolutely. It's clear that Pence is trying to separate himself from Trump and make himself look like a traditional conservative. His supporters are emphasizing his commitment to conservative principles and his character. Interesting. It will be interesting to see how this plays out and if Pence can gain enough support to challenge Trump for the GOP nomination. Yeah, that's for sure. OK, then what's our next news, Hussein? Thank you, Emma. As the political landscape shifts with Mike Pence's supporters rallying around him, the focus is now on finding a compromise between President Biden and congressional leaders that works for everyone. Our sources are reporting that Biden and top congressional leaders had a meeting at the White House to discuss the nation's borrowing limit, and while they expressed optimism about a path forward, they admitted both parties remain far apart on the specifics of a deal. The House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, said the president agreed to appoint a couple of people from his administration to sit down and negotiate directly with his team, and he hopes they start meeting as soon as today. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said Biden's appointing a point person for negotiations is similar to what McConnell recommended former President Trump do in 2019. Biden said there's still work to do to make sure the U.S. avoids defaulting on its debt, and the leaders will speak regularly over the next several days as staff continues to meet daily. But with the debt ceiling deadline looming, Biden decided to cancel the second half of his trip. The two sides are still far apart on spending caps for federal programs, new work requirements for adults without dependents who receive support from safety net programs like food stamps and revenue raisers like closing loopholes in the tax code. Progressive Democrats on Capitol Hill have rejected changing any of the current rules for food stamps and the House Speaker asked if the Democrats have become so progressive, so far to the left, they're changing their policies now and they want to put the country in default. The US Chamber of Commerce is urging lawmakers in both parties to re 
reach a deal, as there's a real risk for miscalculation if they don't leave enough time to finalise a deal and approve it before the early June deadline for avoiding a default. Defaulting on the debt would be a disaster, as it would threaten the government's ability to pay its other bills, potentially including some payments to Social Security or Medicare recipients. So let's hope that the two sides can come to an agreement soon and that the country can avoid defaulting on its debt. Back to you, Emma. Thank you, Hussein. It's time to talk about the Supreme Court's upcoming hearing on congressional subpoena power. This is a rare moment of bipartisanship, as both the Biden and Trump administrations have agreed that the case should be heard. It all started back in 2013 when Donald Trump made a deal with the General Services Administration to lease the old post office building in Washington, D.C. for his Trump International Hotel. When the GSA refused to give out documents, 17 Democratic members of the 45-person committee used an obscure law from 1928 that allowed seven members of the House committee to take the GSA to court to get the documents. This was a workaround since the Democrats were in the minority at the time. The case went on for years until the final days of the Trump administration, when a three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia ruled two, one that the GSA had to comply with the subpoena. Even though the full appeals court declined to reconsider the panel's decision, four of the court's most conservative members dissented. They said that any subpoena right is an institutional right, not a right belonging to individual members of the House. The Biden administration is now citing these dissenting opinions, arguing that congressional requests for information from executive agencies have traditionally been negotiated between the two branches. So what does this mean for us? Well, it's a reminder that the power of the government is divided between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. This case is an example of how the Supreme Court can help keep the balance of power in check. It's also a reminder that the government can work together, even when it's divided between two different parties. I hope this has been an entertaining and educational look at the Supreme Court's upcoming hearing. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you tomorrow.